Well, good morning. And thank you, everybody, for those of you who've managed to make it here this morning. Um, we're just waiting for a few more to who've registered to, to, to come into the room. Uh, a few hiccups with uh, storms in the UK and uh, very slow internet um, access. So whilst we're waiting for the rest to, to come in, um, it's my pleasure this morning to welcome our speaker uh, for, this, for this lecture, uh, Agni Mokhtar. Um, I'd like to introduce her briefly um, and then we'll get started. Thank you, Agni, for providing this, this, this abstract. Um, it's been said frequently in the narratives of pre-modern Java that the Brantas River played a significant role in supporting the society living in its basin and, and to prosper from this. Not only uh, did the river support agriculture by being the main source of irrigation, um, and it still does today, but it also provided an easy route for trade between the inland and coastal areas up to the 19th, early 19th century. Um, this lecture will show how people in the Delta interacted with the river um, and the coastal environment to understand the maritime cultural landscape formed by such, by such interactions and by emphasizing the river's role as a continuation of the ocean. Um, historical and epigraphic studies have contributed to the discussion about the cultural dynamics in the Brontos River Delta, although um, incomprehensively, um, uh, whereas archeological research um, is almost absent. While the archeologists have expressed interest in the Brontos River, the focus of their investigations have mainly been on terrestrial data uh, from along the river's upper and midstream. This talk will review the studies previously conducted um, and describe the results of recent archaeological surveys and ethnographic study uh, in the Brantos River Delta to interpret the maritime aspects of pre-modern society. Included in this interpretation are the ancient river system and the types of vessels used to navigate the river and the ocean. A little bit about Agni, she lives in Yogyakarta in Indonesia. Uh, she's a PhD candidate at the Department of Asia, Africa and the Mediterranean at the University of Naples, Orientale. And she's a researcher at the Regional Agency for Archaeological Research in Yogyakarta Special Region. She received her bachelor's degree in archaeology from Universitas Garjamada in Yogyakarta, and she continued her study in, uh, uh, with a Master of Maritime Archaeology at Flinders University in South Australia. Her thesis was titled The Seventh Century Punjul Harjo Boat from Indonesia, a study of the early Southeast Asian Lashlug boat building tradition. Um, and she was awarded um, a prize in 2018 for best thesis. And her latest work is this investigation of maritime cultural landscapes in Brantos River in East Java. Um, and we look forward now to hearing from you, Agni, uh, for the next uh, 40, 45 minutes, and then it'll be followed by questions. So thank you, Agni. Thank you, Heidi, for um, the introduction. Um, I'm very honored. Um, to be invited to this uh, seminar series. Um, I know that um, a lot of scholars um, had kind of like presented their works and they were amazing. And um, I hope uh, all of you will also uh, enjoy my presentation today. So um, I will start my presentation. Um, let me share my screen first. Um, can you see it clearly? I yes, we can. can. Yeah, cool. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so um, first of all, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening. Um, depends on wherever um, you're joining from. Um, it is 6 uh, p.m. in um, Yogyakarta uh, right now. Uh, and Luckily, today is a good day, no raining, so uh, hopefully there will be no um, trouble with the internet connections. So um, yeah, today I'm uh, talking about the uh, highway to prosperity about the Brantas River Delta in pre-modern pre Java. Um, 
as Heidi said uh, before, I am a PhD student at the uh, University of Naples, Orientale. Uh, I'm also a researcher uh, working previously for the Ministry of Education and Culture, and we now move to the National Agency of Research and uh, Innovation in Indonesia. Uh, so for this um, project, uh, basically, uh, I will kind of like talk um, about the maritime culture landscape uh, studies on the uh, Brantas River Delta. And uh, of course, I didn't do it uh, alone. Um, I uh, was accompanied uh, by uh, excellent team uh, who work really hard on this project. And we try to kind of like, um, understand the role of the Brantas River uh, in the connectivity between the island and the coastal uh, area in pre-modern Java. Um, overall, uh, I will start with the introduction and then move on to um, background and talk um, quite a lot about the prevailing knowledge and uh, and so what we kind of like learn further from uh, this projects and then a few uh, remarks to kind of like um, close this presentation. Uh, we start with the introduction. This is the uh, map if you are not familiar uh, with Indonesia, uh, the Brantas River is on the East Java here, uh, and the Delta uh, is around Surabaya and Pasuruan. So basically the um, red rectangle uh, was our um, study area. Uh, and uh, you might uh, read, I will mention about the Solo River also a little bit. And uh, because these two rivers um, are the two uh, longest river uh, in Java. So uh, they have uh, played uh, as a key factors uh, for the uh, kind of cultural development um, since like the uh, early century of this um, millennium. Uh, so the Brantas uh, River project or Brantas Maritime project, uh, it was initiated in uh, 2019. So about um, three or four years ago, it was funded by the Ministry of Education and Culture. Uh, I was still in the uh, regional agency for archeological research in uh, Daerah Istimewa Yogyakarta province. And um, we did the first field work in 2019. Unfortunately, of course, we couldn't uh, do it uh, in the uh, 2020 because of the pandemic, but we did um, a desk-based study. And then uh, we uh, able to kind of like do the second field work uh, last year. But it, it, it might sound a bit like uh, weird when I kind of like say the desk-based study, of course, each field work um, was kind of like uh, started with the desk-based study we, before we went to the field, but like it's just kind of like to show that we did the best we could during the pandemic when we couldn't go uh, to the field. Um, what we did uh, for the project, so uh, we did the terrestrial and underwater archaeological uh, survey. Uh, the terrestrial uh, survey was conducted um, along the uh, riverbank uh, on the two main branches of the um, Brantas River, uh, named uh, Kalimas or Gold River uh, and Kaliporong or Porong River. And also we did um, site scan sonar survey and we also did ethnographic study. Uh, we visited the um, shipyard, traditional shipyards to kind of like see uh, how the uh, tradition, uh, was it still kind of like continue until today or completely different uh, with uh, what people did in the past. Uh, of course, we also kind of like consulted with um, all the references that we uh, could grab uh, reports, articles, and books, and um, the archive, the old maps, and uh, photos, uh, mainly from uh, the uh, Dutch collection. Um, so start with the uh, Brantas River. So the Brantas River 
was kind of like um, well uh, acknowledged, uh, started in the uh, 10th century uh, when the economic and political centers um, of kind of like the society shifted to East Java. I didn't say um, that before the 10th century, there, there was nothing in East Java, of course not. Uh, there were already um, people living there and we can see it from uh, inscriptions and also uh, temples and other archeological remains found. Um, they kind of like uh, provided us with evidence of uh, settlements uh, in East Java. But uh, we can say, from the historiography uh, before there, like, like the main kingdoms uh, in Java at the time, uh, prior to the 10th century, uh, were concentrated uh, on the central Java. And then uh, in the 10th century, they kind of like moved to East Java. And uh, one of the uh, earliest um, archaeological uh, proof, so to say, uh, it's the Anjukladang inscription, you can see the pictures over here. Um, it, it tells us about uh, the victory of uh, the uh, Mataram Kingdom King who uh, defeated um, the king from the um, Malay Kingdom. And then uh, the stone was kind of like erected to kind of like celebrate their uh, victory. And uh, like I said, by the time uh, the two main uh, rivers, the Solo River and the Brandas River, had been the key factor to a uh, flourishing trade and system. So um, I think one of the reasons why uh, the kings uh, moved their kind of like political uh, center to East Java is also to kind of like move closer to the already established um, trade system and um, the trade system itself was um, flourished around the um, the river system, either the Solo River and the uh, Brantas River. Uh, about the delta itself, so the downstream of the Brantas River, um, it was first uh, mentioned during the Airlanga Kingdom uh, around the 11th century. Uh, you can see here on um, the right hand uh, side uh, of the presentation, this is a um, statue of a uh, toad as kind of like the symbol of um, Air Langa, uh, depicted as the um, Garuda Vishnu Kanchana, so uh, Vishnu um, who is set on top of uh, the Garuda. And the kingdom itself was then divided into two. Uh, in, it's, it's quite a famous um, story in Java actually about the um, division of the uh, kingdom. Uh, so the two kingdoms uh, associated with each uh, downstream branches of the uh, of the Brantas River, uh, the Kalimas. Uh, this one Kalimas is um, goes all the way to the north and uh, ends in Surabaya. And for uh, Kaliporong, uh, it flows uh, to the east um, to the Madura Strait. And so why we, uh, why did we decide to kind of like focusing uh, only on the Delta? Um, because before that, uh, the epigraphy and manuscript studies has been uh, really, really did it in the Delta. Uh, starting um, 18th century, but uh, unfortunately the archaeology studies uh, was uh, almost non-exist um, because most of the archaeological uh, project uh, was focused more on the upstream and the midstream. And like um, I would say many of uh, the Hindu uh, Buddhist archaeological projects, um, most of them are kind of like more kingdom oriented. So the, the theme uh, of the, the research wasn't kind of like well developed. So um, like other things like maritime um, aspect of the, the society at the time 
uh, wasn't um, well studied. And uh, also because there is a rapid development on the Delta area, and it was a challenge for us to kind of like did uh, the survey, especially um, toward the coastal area, like in uh, Surabaya. Um, so it, it's it's a big city uh, right now. So it, it was very difficult to kind of like uh, did a survey and look for uh, archaeological remains, um, especially from the uh, pre-modern era. So, so um, we thought that it's, it's a good thing that we, we started uh, a project to kind of like um, gather uh, data uh, about the archaeological remains, especially uh, from, from the pre-modern uh, era. Actually, the project itself was kind of like um, did survey on, on the, the archaeological remains from the 11th to the 20th uh, century, but for this presentation, uh, I will focus um, only on the uh, pre-modern uh, era. And um, also because uh, now we are in Indonesia, we, we kind of like face a very different situation with the rivers. Um, many, many uh, rivers um, in Indonesia are uh, not in a so good condition. Uh, they are very highly polluted and like a lot of um, litters and everything. And um, basically uh, many people kind of like use the river to kind of like uh, dump everything. Um, and it's really bad and it's totally completely different with uh, what happened in the past. And we uh, really want to kind of like uh, study uh, about um, you know, the, the kind of like the shifting, what happened uh, in the past that kind of like changed uh, how people see the river drastically. And uh, about the prevailing knowledge, of course, um, even though the archaeological um, studies were still scarcely done in this area, um, like I said, the um, epigraphy and also the manuscript studies um, did um, a really good um, projects about this. And uh, the uh, people in Java, especially here, are very familiar uh, with, with um, what happened uh, in the past, at least from uh, those two uh, studies. And here, um, you can see uh, on the screen, it is um, some kind of like the uh, dioramas or models um, made uh, in the uh, 1970s about uh, the building of um, a dam in, uh, in the river to kind of like um, solve the problem of uh, the floating. So um, it is a very famous um, stories and I will talk um, a bit uh, more uh, later, but we start uh, um, about what uh, so far has been uh, done uh, in the um, river, uh, Brantas River Delta, sorry. So um, one of the um, famous topics is about the riverine harbors. Uh, one of the uh, inscription is called the Changu inscription. You can see here from the 14th century, also known as the very chap uh, the ferry chapter. Uh, it has been studied um, quite intensively. And uh, in the inscription, it was mentioned about the harbors or ports along the Brantas River and also the Solo River. But for today, I will also, uh, only focus um, for the ones on the Brantas River. Um, here I put the uh, name of um, the villages uh, where uh, the, the harbors um, uh, were given the, the kind of like a, a grant from, from the king uh, not to uh, pay the tax because they kind of like contributed significantly uh, on the uh, economic um, activities um, at the time. So um, it was very interesting uh, because people uh, and, uh, and scholars uh, did a lot of research on this topic and um, kind of like discuss a lot. And uh, some of them 
start to look for uh, where the modern location uh, of this harbor. So um, they kind of like uh, look for uh, the toponyms, so the the places that still have uh, the same name with um, the one mentioned in the inscription. And they did a survey and look for um, other proof, other evidence, um, like archaeological remains, and kind of like build um, uh, like a interpretation of um, where the, the harbors and the ports uh, were uh, in the 14th century. And um, this is kind of like the early um, scholarly work about that kind of uh, investigation that I mentioned. So this is Colin Fells. Um, he was uh, a Dutch officer assigned to work in uh, Java uh, at the time, or also in other parts of Indonesia, actually. Uh, so in the late 19th uh, centuries, he kind of like survey and travel um, along the, the Brantas River uh, on the Delta and kind of like look for um, evidence uh, of the, uh, the old harbors. But, um, I think he was mainly kind of like used the inscriptions um, as as the uh, as the basic of his uh, investigation and look for uh, the similarity and names. Um, it's unfortunately still in uh, black and white. So, but I will kind of like try to show you here. Um, so the darkened uh, spots uh, are the places that he thought was the location of the um, old uh, harbor and ports, so from here. And uh, you can see the uh, modern, I mean, at the time uh, in the uh, late 19th century, the, the river was um, here. This is the, the modern um, uh, stream, but um, Cullen Fells kind of like noticed that all the places uh, of the harbor uh, were a bit uh, southern of, of the current um, stream, a bit over here. So he kind of like, um, he made a hypothetical uh, stream, so to say. So for example, like this, the, the modern, um, kind of like the where where the river was uh, divided is here, uh, but uh, he argued that uh, in the past um, or at least uh, at in the eleventh centuries the the branches uh, should be kind of like divide uh, over here, and so this is his hypothetical lines. Uh, and the modern lines was over here. So um, we can see that uh, there was quite a significant um, changes uh, of, of the, the river stream. And uh, also uh, this one is, is a bit um, overlooked many times, uh, in my opinion, about the watercraft uh, use uh, on the river and uh, on the nearby ocean, but um, there is a work by uh, Christie uh, in 1982. Uh, one of the inscriptions that she studied was the Dimanasrama inscription uh, from the 11th century. And in that inscription, uh, it was mentioned over 40 types of vessels. Um, so the vessels uh, were seagoing and also the riverine boats and ships, which is magnificent, I think. And um, most of them were named after their functions. So it, the inscription mentioned uh, different types of uh, vessel for um, different uh, fishes they catch and also different tools they use when they did um, the fishing and also whether it was uh, for the river stream or for um, seagoing vessels. So um, 
it was it was a very uh, extensive um, collection, I guess, so uh, about the boats and the ship. But unfortunately, the, the inscription itself only mentioned the names uh, of the type of vessels. Um, it didn't uh, mention anything about uh, like the components of the boats or the ships. So it was really hard to kind of like um, interpret how the boats and the ship uh, look like uh, in the past. And, uh, and also, uh, so this is like, like um, an upgrade from the inscriptions. Uh, here uh, you can see from the book, uh, describing the first fleet of um, Cornelis de Houtman um, to uh, Java and uh, in the 16th century. Um, it depicts uh, various types of uh, boat and ships uh, in Java. And if you are familiar uh, with the very famous um, Borobudur uh, reliefs about boats, you can see a lot of similarities here. For example, like the, um, the rectangle um, sails and also uh, the moss over here. We, of course, we couldn't see like the inside constructions of the hull, but um, a lot of features that we can see here uh, are similar to the one uh, in Borobudur relief, which is dated from the 9th century. And this is from the 16th century. So it was amazing to kind of like see um, how this kind of like features uh, survive for like quite a long time. And um, this is also another very famous uh, topic when we are uh, talking about the um, Brantas River Delta. It's about the water management. Uh, this is like, I think it's the most famous inscription from the Delta. It's called the Kamalagi. Okay, sorry, I think um, we may have lost Agni's sound. Let's just wait a moment for her to come back in. Okay, we're just waiting for Agni to reconnect. Hi Agni, if you can reconnect, could you uh, kindly turn your video off? That might help uh, the reception. Yeah, um, sorry Heidi, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I lost my internet connection. Um, let me start again. Um, sure, just try and uh, share your... Where did you lost me? Uh, the Kamalagan uh, inscription. This one? Can yes, you see? that's it. That's it. Okay. okay. Thanks. Okay, cool. Turn, turn yeah. your video off. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, sorry, everyone. <laughs> the internet connection was really bad. Um, so yeah, I'll start again with the Kamalagian inscription. Um, it is one of the, I, well, I think it's like the most famous inscription from the Delta. Um, it was dated from the uh, 11th century. Uh, it's also known as the Kalagian inscription. Uh, it's mainly talking about the building of um, a dam to control uh, the flood. But um, as you can see here, it's, uh, it's a quite a big stone and it has a lot of lines. So um, it tells a lot of stories about the, um, the Delta, the, the uh, communities uh, around the Delta around the 11th century. 
uh, it mentioned about how people was devastated because um, their paddy field uh, were floated um, by the river. So they kind of like asked the, the king, the Ayerlanga king to kind of like, what should we do um, with this problem? And so the king decided to kind of like build a dam to kind of like control the flood. Uh, until now, there's still a lot of debate about uh, the location um, of the dam itself, because um, until now we couldn't find the um, like the structure, the actual archaeological remains of that structure. So um, it is very still very um, interesting uh, debate and discussion around this topic. But also, um, I put like a, a short um, chapter from the inscription. Um, it is written in a Kawi script in old Javanese language. So the um, language itself is already extinct. So you don't have to kind of like worry if um, you don't understand uh, whatever it, um, it says here. But um, more or less it, sell, uh, it say that uh, after they finish, uh, the building of um, the dam, everyone were so happy and um, people coming from uh, far, away places, uh, far away places uh, on boats uh, to kind of like um, sail uh, their boats uh, to the upstream of the river. And they kind of like gathered in uh, one of the harbor called uh, Hujunggalu to kind of like uh, dip do the uh, the trade and they collect many stuff uh, and it was amazing to kind of like uh, see how it was actually written um, that people uh, were using the uh, river itself to kind of like as the transportation road uh, sorry Um, yeah, and so uh, what we did for for the project, we 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 acknowledge that many people uh, had done uh, magnificent work uh, about the the delta area, but we want to kind of like try approach uh, this topic from the uh, maritime cultural landscape perspective and so we try to kind of like collect um, all the data and all, all the research uh, result um, that has been done uh, previously and we try to kind of like add uh, what we found uh, during the field work uh, also what we found uh, during uh, the literature review. Uh, so we, the first thing or, and also the main thing that we did uh, was we revisit uh, the road. So um, we kind of like visit nearly uh, 200 um, places, 200 uh, sites, and we collected all the coordinates and um, kind of like put it together. You can see here uh, on the map um, all the all the places that we visited and uh, I mentioned earlier uh, the sites were uh, approximately from the 11th to the 20th century and uh, we collected um, the coordinates uh, and the data from the uh, terrestrial sites along the um, streams uh, but and also uh, the uh, uh, underwater uh, remains uh, either the one on the riverbed and also um, near the estuaries. Uh, we, we couldn't survey this area because um, it is a very uh, busy um, harbor uh, today. Uh, it's uh, in uh, Surabaya, so it was impossible for us to kind of like, you know, dive uh, or even uh, did the uh, site scan sonar there. And, uh, and after that, after we kind of like um, plot all the coordinates, 
uh, of the sites and we overlay um, a lot of uh, maps actually so we we uh, overlaid uh, the maps uh, made by Kallenfeld um, I showed earlier about his interpretations of the location uh, of the harbors and we also um, studied a lot of inscriptions to kind of like um, add uh, toponyms uh, places mentioned in the inscription and uh, we try to uh, from there, we try to kind of like uh, reconstruct the the old um, river stream. So um, it's quite different with the the modern one, the current one. Uh, so here on the map, the the blue um, lines are the current uh, streams. You can see over here. Uh, the two main branches of the river uh, I mentioned uh, before this one is Kalimas go uh, up north to uh, Surabaya and this one is Kaliporong uh, goes um, eastward um, to Madura Strait and uh, the yellow line over here is the um, what we interpret as uh, the old um, the old stream uh, so we we didn't say that um, what we see today is like completely a new stream but but because it's a delta and and, and the the river um, is kind of like you know very um, active and a lot of like small streams so uh, it was possible to kind of like the the main stream was kind of like changes um, along the centuries. And uh, from, from what we gathered on the field here, um, I think there's, there's one big um, issue that we want to kind of like address because previously um, the scholars proposed that uh, there was only like one main river stream. So uh, they thought that the harbors uh, and the ports uh, were kind of like reflecting uh, the mainstream of the river in the past. So there's only like one line. Uh, but uh, from what we learn on the field, uh, we argue that um, since, since in the past there were kind of like uh, some, like a few streams, so, so there, was, there was not uh, the, the only stream uh, used uh, as transportation route uh, at the time, because you can see over here, uh, Kallenfels in his map uh, kind of like grow um, these dots because he couldn't find any um, like old stream over here. And, and we thought, well, there was none there there was none since the past so um this one over here belonged to the the small stream over here and so uh, we were talking about um like like several roads uh, of uh, river stream used as uh, transportation ways uh, at the time and uh from so also uh, what we did uh, during the field work uh, that has that has not been done before so we kind of like look for uh, archaeological remains from um, underwater either the river bed uh, and also from the seabed um, so for the the river bed we we only did the site scan sonar uh, on the kaliporong so uh, the one um, goes uh, eastward because that's the only possible um, pos possible river that we can we can do this because the other one the one uh, goes um, up north to Surabaya uh, it, it is a very kind of like crowded uh, um, area and there are a lot of bridges and a lot of uh, water controlling uh, structures so we couldn't really kind of like um, maneuver uh, the boats to kind of like uh, do the side scan sonar. So um, 
Fortunately, we the site scan sonar uh, detected um, at least three possible shipwrecks on the riverbed, and um, four uh, possible uh, shipwrecks uh, on the Madura Strait. Madura Strait, but uh, we couldn't dive the river because it was like highly polluted. Um, I couldn't kind of like ask the diving team to uh, to dive uh, the water because like it was so uh, too dangerous to kind of like do that. And the one uh, over here uh, on the right hand side was uh, very close to the estuaries. Uh, we the the team uh, dived there and it was a um, wooden ship but uh, we we haven't done like uh, more research on it so uh, we we can't kind of like uh, tell you uh, like the the date the the age of the ships and everything but um, it's a start and we are looking to kind of like uh, do a further research on this area and uh, we also kind of like did the um, ethnographic studies to uh, understand the living traditions, the maritime traditions um, survive uh, from the past until now. So we visited the traditional um, uh, shipyard or boat yards, and uh, we learned that uh, people there uh, are still making or building their boats using the uh, shell first construction technique and um, dowels and tree nails uh, as primary fastening. Um, they don't use uh, sails anymore right now because they already using the um, engines to to power their uh, boats and ships. So uh, there is kind of like uh, the lack of the data um, we couldn't find. But you, we learned so much uh, from our survey there, uh, for example, like how they using the dowels and the system uh, to kind of like put everything in place and um, how they have a very, very good kind of like mental map to kind of like build the uh, shell first construction because of the shell first construction, they don't have like frames to kind of like guide uh, how they put uh, the hull and it was amazing to kind of like see uh, people uh, like learning and like doing it uh, skillfully until now and uh, from there we kind of like uh, the the interesting thing is because we also kind of uh, learned about um, archaeological um, sites with like old uh, wooden boats uh, and ships. So we know uh, that the traditions of using um, the dowels or the tree nails and also um, using the shell first construction kind of like survive until now. And, and it's, it's quite amazing to kind of like learn about that. And um, you can see here, this is a, their kind of like simple and uh, traditional way to bend um, the planks. Uh, they use uh, fire, of course, they fired the planks and uh, they tied it with the ropes uh, and everything um, are still done uh, in a very simple method and everything, but they are very efficient. And also, um, they still kind of like uh, do the river crossing activities using boats known as uh, tambangan. If you recall the Changu inscriptions uh, mentioning about the river in harbors, the inscription also mentioned about uh, tambangan. So tambangan is um, derived from the words tambang means the, the rope. Um, so, so they say uh, the the act of kind of like crossing the river using um, the ropes and boats is called tambangan. And today people are still using that exact same words to kind of like uh, describe uh, the places they use to kind of like cross um, the, the river. Because this one over here, um, this is near the estuary of the Kaliporong. Um, the, the river itself is still like very wide uh, up to like 200 meters wide so um, and they choose um, 
this kind of kind of like crossing the river gets it's very effective uh, it's done really fast and etc and um yeah it, it's um it's very very uh, interesting to kind of like um learn that people are kind of like uh, unconsciously using uh, the old words that probably uh, they didn't know uh, that the the word itself was already um, in use like almost over um, a thousand years ago and so from from all the data that we gathered uh, we we try to kind of like um, combine everything and we we try to kind of like um, put everything to kind of like uh, interpret the maritime cultural landscape uh, around the Delta. And uh, it can see, uh, it can be seen clearly uh, how organized the, the division of land use and landscape. So we can see clearly that people in the past are very, were very, very aware of um, their environment. So um, I think I should go back a bit to um, sorry the map so it will be easier like over here um, so the orange uh, um, like dots over here are like a very um, crowded settlements and um, it thought that uh, this is near the the fishing uh the fishing harbors so all the ships and boats uh used by fishermen were gathered here and people um, who are coming to kind of like do the trading uh all the passengers uh went like a bit further um over here there's a big there was a big uh harbor over here before they went uh beyond uh to the upstream area and um, they can go um, eastward uh, from, from here or from, from over here. Uh, so there were a lot of options, a lot of effective um, routes they, they uh, could choose uh, to kind of like uh, navigate um, their area and also go to um, nearby islands, uh, et cetera. And I would go back again. Sorry. Oh, yeah. So uh, because of a lot of easy uh, transportation routes, um, there, there was like almost non-existence gap between the inland and the uh, coastal area because um, goods and people coming from faraway places can easily kind of like uh, uh, maneuver and navigate uh, the stream to go to the inland area. So um, there was no delay in kind of like changing goods or um, informations or other uh, needs uh, in the past. And uh, we also kind of like uh, noticed that uh, there was like a, a substantial changes along um, the river, uh, especially uh, after, well, just right after the end of the pre-modern pre era. So um, in the uh, late 19th century, started from the 19th centuries to the early 20th centuries, um, people uh, started to attempt to control the transportation and trade route um, because uh, the, um, uh, the VOC, the Dutch um, trading company, uh, came uh, to this area and they kind of like built um, like, a, uh, like a port uh, near the Surabaya and then they want to kind of like control everything uh, goes in and goes out at the time. And uh, later on, um, mostly the uh, Dutch colonial um, government introduced the modern water uh, management um, structures because uh, the Brantas River, it is, it is very, um, it's quite difficult to kind of like control the waters because like abundance of water, um, they are really good as a source for irrigations and also um, later 
to kind of like uh, for the, their industrial purpose, but also um, there was a lot of lot and everything. So they started to kind of like build um, like uh, bridges and also uh, dam and everything. And uh, just in the 20th century, uh, it ended up with like, uh, so the transportation was stopped because people couldn't sail uh, the river uh, anymore. So they, they uh, could only kind of like sail on, on short, um, short route from between one bridges to another, things like that. And uh, of course, um, if you're familiar with the um, culture, uh, culture stelsel uh, introduced by the uh, Dutch colonial um, government. So the, the river was kind of like uh, manipulated to uh, serve uh, the industrial purpose, uh, especially the Delta was very famous of their um, sugar uh, factories. And uh, since then, uh, there was like a very uh, drastic uh, changes happen uh, on the river and also on how people um, interacted with the river. Um, so uh, to kind of like uh, close this presentation, um, I really don't like to kind of conclude because I don't think this project um, is finished. So we, we need to kind of like do uh, more things, but just a few remarks. Um, from what we have done so far, it's already uh, clear that the maritime cultural landscape was well structured and it, it is truly reflecting um, how people's perception of the uh, environment they live in. And um, absolutely the, the Brantas River provided a very uh, convenient channels to kind of like connect the inland and the coastal area. So um, why this area became so prosper because the distribution of goods of uh, also the um, movement of people and um, also the ideas and everything. And then also welfare, it was really easy uh, to this um, river channel. And uh, the system was well maintained uh, during the pre-modern period, uh, but later drastically changed in the uh, 19th to the 20th uh, century. And uh, of course, uh, like I said, I didn't work alone. And uh, thanks to the, uh, the Maritime Brantas uh, project team uh, who worked really, really hard uh, on this project and also local government institution uh, that we uh, work with and also the um, Cultural Preservation uh, Office uh, in East Java. And a special thanks to the traditional boat builders in Pasuruan for um, sharing uh, their knowledge about uh, the boat building and everything. And also um, three organizations, uh, our partner, every time we uh, went to the field work for uh, this project. And that's it from me. Thank you, terima kasih, grazie. If you um, want to kind of like have a chat or you want to discuss uh, everything and especially um, I am very, very willing to kind of like, uh, you know, get all the critics or, or um, you know, inputs and everything to kind of like better this project, uh, please uh, do not hesitate to kind of like contact me uh, on this email. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Agni, um, for that fascinating and really comprehensive um, also survey of, of what's been done to date. Um, we have quite a few questions here, so we're gonna move on swiftly now into the Q&A. Um, and I hope that, as you say, it, there's still so much work to be done. I hope that um, the experts in our audience today will, will weigh in here and uh, um, bring in more to the discussion about what more we can, we can do. Um, just like to start at the top, really, uh, the chat box here, and just to see, um, uh, there's a question here <clears throat> from, um, from Leslie Pullen. Um, who has asked something quite specific. Can you estimate how many days it would have taken 
to sail from the Delta mouth to the heartland of the Singasari area, say, for example, to Malang area? And also, is this area affected by tidal variations? Uh, yeah, um, thank you for uh, the questions. Um, we've never done like kind of like experimental um, uh, trial, uh, you know, navigating um, the river, but, and it's possible, it's impossible uh, to do that today. But um, there are some manuscripts uh, like telling us about this, not, not to Malang, but at least from Surabaya to Trawulan, so where the Majapahit Kingdom. Uh, uh, was located. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I have to check it again. Uh, it took them kind of like two days uh, to kind of like navigate uh, the the river from Surabaya to um, uh, to Trawulan to to the the capital of uh, Majapahit Kingdom. But it didn't say. Uh, about uh, are they uh, were they doing it nonstop or did they stop? along the way, but um, approximately, if I'm not mistaken, around two days from Surabaya to um, Trawulan. And uh, I, I have no data to kind of like do it all the way to Malang. Okay. I hope that's answered the questions. Thank you. And uh, the next question from Ian McCann. Uh, Agni, was there any physical evidence of any of the 34 ports? um like the 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 port itself there there is um not not from the 34 uh, so far we we couldn't um found it uh but there is like one side that we want to in face to get more uh i think uh it was also an old harbor but um it's not mentioned in that um specific uh, inscription, but it was mentioned on another inscriptions. So there's one possible site uh, that we are planning to kind of like work on in the future. It's, it's, a, it's a high possibility that it is um, an old port. Okay, thanks. Um, a third question, is the Siduajo mud flow destroying any archeological evidence? Is it changing the flow of the river at all? Um, yes, so, uh, so the, the side scan sonar uh, survey uh, we did on uh, Kaliporong, uh, it was the river um, where, where the, the mud uh, was kind of like, um, the, so the mud was sent uh, to, to the, that specific uh, river. So um, we learned from the uh, from the side scan sonar result, um, it was difficult to kind of like um, identify uh, what is on the riverbed. Uh, we we could only like you know uh, identify three possible shipwrecks, and because from from another um, area, it's uh, in Kendiri, so a bit more uh, midstream of the river uh, people like uh, found a lot of like small objects from the riverbed like a lot so so many like um, uh, very good artifacts from the riverbed but um, that they didn't happen uh, on the uh, the Kaliporong the Porong River because um, I believe uh, they were covered by uh, the mud and because because of the the mud from from uh, Siduarjo, we couldn't we couldn't dive that that water because it, it it's just too dangerous for us. Interesting. Okay, and here's a question from Veronica Vadillo, who I think uh, was not able to stay to hear your answer, but she's going to listen to the recording afterwards. Uh -huh. uh, she's saying, uh, I was wondering if you have compared the floodplain surface area with the archaeological sites or traditional settlement patterns. Um, she says, in the Mekong, people tend to remain just outside the floodplain. And a second question, I'm also finding very interesting things related to floodplain fishing traditions, uh, which is part of maritime landscapes. 
Have you included this in your research or are you planning to do it at some point? Um, yeah, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm quite familiar with Veronica's work on, on the, the uh, flood plain uh, on the Mekong. Uh, I think it's a bit uh, different uh, situation with uh, what we have in uh, Brantas Delta because um, the, the stream like changes quite intensively uh, along the, the century. So I think also that that made the, the, the flood plan was kind of like also shifting. But um, during the survey, we, we did find um, like uh, the Hindu and or Buddhist temple, like very, very close um, to the, the river stream. So, um, and also like from, from, from a later uh, period from around the 19th uh, century, people were building their houses uh, like straight in front, in front of the river or uh, exactly on, on the river bank. So um, it's, I think we have a very completely, you know, probably not completely, but I think slightly different um, situation because uh, people, people didn't avoid uh, didn't avoid the, the river and they are kind of like okay with kind of like staying on what should be the flood plain of the river. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay. And um, we have another question here. Um, I apologize if this question is very simple, but at any point in history was the Solo, were the Solo and Brantas rivers sharing a single catchment area? Or rather, if these rivers had had they ever met in their northward course? Um, no, that's that's not a simple question. There, no, um, actually, the um, I believe um, near near the um, near the coastal uh, area on East Java, the two uh, rivers um, do share uh, the water catchment area, but they. They uh, they never kind of like meet the stream so so yeah yeah no there there is no one point where the two river uh, meet each other but um, in several places uh, they are quite close so they share the the water catchment area. Okay, and then there's um, a comment here. Thank you for this informative presentation. I have very interesting. This research covers a very wide area of time from the classical period of Indonesia to the recent time. Um, what has become, what are the difficulties uh, while conducting this research and how do you maintain and keep focus while the data is very abundant? Thank you. Um, yeah, so we, we discuss about um, this kind of like um, the era that we are working on, and it is true that it's it's quite quite um, a long uh, period from the 11th to the 20th century. Be but we we decided to kind of like uh, do this because we we want to um, catch uh, like when did the drastic the districtal chains happen. So if we are only focusing on like, for example, maybe uh, during the Majapahit um, kingdom era or only on the um, Dutch colonial era, we can't do that because um, we want to catch the, the, like the process, um, what happened uh, in the past and why the, the situation in the past completely different uh, with what we have now. So that's why we, we kind of like decided to have this um, long period. And um, it is difficult. So um, we, one, one, one challenge that we kind of like noticed that um, we can't kind of like focus uh, on, on a very specific um, area or uh, one uh, specific like time period. So, but this is, um, we want this as a pilot project. So we kind of like gather uh, like so many data, but 
uh, rather briefly and we kind of like encourage um, other people or maybe even our team in the future to kind of like choose uh, more focus uh, smaller topics but for for this pilot project we kind of like want to catch like the, the big picture first uh, what happened uh, in the past that caused the, uh, the, des the drastic uh, change um, of how people interacting uh, with the river. Sure, yeah, okay, that's interesting. Um, okay, there's a question here from Sarah Ward. Um, Agni, thanks for sharing your field results. Uh, research in the pandemic is challenging and you've done well. Will you be doing any geomorpholo geomorphological research to determine where the river was at the different points in history so you can correlate that with the sites you are finding and from each period? Um, yes, definitely, Sarah. Thank you very much. Uh, that's uh, also one of the plans that we are um, want to work on uh, in in the future because we we kind of like uh, acknowledge that like um, well, our dream is to kind of like the to date um, where the the possible uh, changes of of uh, of the river but but we'll see yeah uh, there's uh one thing that we don't have enough data uh, the geomorphological geomorphological uh, data so yeah we are planning to do that in the future thank you Sarah. thanks and um i had a question and this comes back to your your topic close to your heart your master's uh, work thesis um the lashed lug um boat building tradition is so uh, seems to be so ubiquitous in this area and um, it seems to be a kind of a way of building that it's it's really sustainable and really long lasting um, and it must have been really important to people at the time to to build boats that they knew would go on maybe being used for several generations i don't know how, how, how does um, the boat that you, the one in the Northern Java area, uh, you, the one you studied, um, how does that compare with evidence from the Borobudur or even earlier from, for example, the Pontian River in Pahang in Malaysia? Um, how, how, does, how does it compare? Yeah, so from, from the um, archeological sites, we know that the, the last lap boats um, survive like at least until the 15th to 16th century but um and uh, like uh, i think uh, i did several times and also other scholars did it also to kind of like compare um the similarities uh with what we found on the uh, borobudur um reliefs and everything of course we the 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 last luck is like one of the main uh, character is like inside the hull and from uh, other types of evidence like uh, depiction or a relief we, we we can't see the inside of the hull so that's the main challenge but we do um, kind of like find uh, similarities in features that we can observe so there's um, we kind of like um, quite certain that um, they kind of like share um i don't know i think a lot of similarities but in if i uh mentioned in the, the the delta area itself until now uh we haven't found any uh, archaeological remains in terms of both um remains uh but there's a shipwreck we don't know we we, we should kind of like go uh diving again uh on the shipwreck we found uh, on the on the madura strait uh let's see uh but yeah it's it's like you say it's it's amazing that kind of like the Borobudu reliefs uh, are quite similar with the picture i showed uh, earlier from the 16th century so uh, we know that people kind of like uh, using the same uh, tradition for for quite a long time and uh, i think there there's a high possibility that um the the boats uh, depicted either on the Borobudur reliefs or on the um, depiction from the later period uh, were built using the last lap technique. Mm -hmm. And is there any correlation with the with the shell first technique you mentioned earlier? Um, yeah, yeah. So the 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 last the last lap um, boats were built 
using the shell first uh, technique. So um, it's amazing to see that people still uh, building the boat using that technique. So the one um, we visited the shipyards, we visited um, near the Delta uh, in Pasuruan. They don't use less luck anymore, uh, but they still building it uh, with the shell first construction. So some features are still maintained but some others um, are completely gone. Yeah. And do you think it was, it's particular, this kind of technique is particular, particularly suited to these kinds of conditions, these riverine delta kind of uh, sailing conditions? Is there any? Uh, yeah. Uh, well, if we are talking about the specific less luck um, ships uh, and boats, uh, interestingly, uh, many of the, the archaeological sites that has less luck uh, boat remains or, or ship remains, um, they are associated with uh, river stream. So um, it's, it's really interesting to kind of like uh, see the connection uh, between two of them. I haven't done um, something like very deep uh, in, in terms of uh, how this uh, type of um, boats and ships are related to the river, but but there's there's a fact that um, yeah, like most of the sites um, are close to the river. Yes, that that Pontian boat is in a river. The Butuan yeah. the Butuan boat in the Philippines as well. Um, sure. Yeah, so, interesting. Okay, um, Anga, did you have a question? If you did, please jump in. I can see you're still there. Uh, you have a comment here from Greta Ardianti, who says that she lives near the Brantas River in Tulungagung, and she says, thank you very much for your interesting talk, especially the living tradition of making boats. Um, I'm amazed how great the tradition is in the past. Thank you, Greta. Thank you, Greta. Um, I think, were there any other... Uh, comments and questions. Oh yes, there's one more here. Um, you talk of ports at the estuary of Kaliparong. Can you talk a little more on this? I'm interested as to the trade in the Singasari and Majapahit period, as to how the goods were sh transshipped from the coastal to the river boats. For example, we know at the Musi River in Sumatra, there were no real ports as all goods were transshipped. Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, the 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 one possible uh, harbor site uh, near the estuary um, of Kaliporong, um, it's called the Raus Pecinan. You can see, um, you can like Google on the on the Google Maps, and and you can see it. Actually, we we visited there, and there there is one inscription um, saying that. Um, the King Vijaya from Majapahit uh, crossing that specific area. Um, so he crossed the river there. And uh, when we visited the site, uh, I, we, we thought that, oh, it's, it's, it's a very, very uh, strategic place to kind of like have a harbor uh, there. And um, from the information from the local people, um, they, they kind of like saw um, brick structures uh, near, near the near where we uh, surveyed, and uh, I think we think that uh, that is a very uh, good location for harbor, and we are planning to kind of like I think we have to kind of excavate the site to kind of like see uh, the actual structures of the harbor. Okay, thanks. And I think we have time for one more question. Um, oh, there are a few questions here from Asiadi. Uh, let's see. Um, let's take one here. It's, it's, some, it's a question about the, the relationship between upstream and downstream in material culture. Um, okay. I'm trying to understand which what the question is about actually because there are sort of like four parts to this. Uh, the reference to theory by Miriam Stark about river civilizations, what kinds of rivers influence material culture in the pre-modern period. If there was down, 
I presume that means downstream control, the transportation in the Brantos River. In the Brantos River, how about what kind of upstream control did they have? Do you understand this question about downstream and upstream? I'm, I'm reading it uh, on the chat. Uh, yeah, so uh, from from my gather from from the questions, um, because our uh, main uh, survey area uh, is on on the the downstream the delta. So um, a lot of the answer I will give um, will kind of like mostly um, downstream oriented uh, answer. Uh, like you say here, if the down control transportation the Brentus River yep yeah, of course like the most strategic um, kind of like first step to control the transportation um, is kind of like uh, controlling the the coastal area so the first stop uh, of of people coming uh, and also the last stop of people going from the inland so it's a very very um, understandable um, strategy to kind of like control um, the, the downstream uh, of the river if if someone wants to kind of like see uh, what happened uh, there because um, well specifically if we are talking about the um, the Dutch um, trading company the POC uh, they they kind of like want to control the trade uh, between the people in Java and uh, the people from outside of Java. So it's it's uh, really understandable that they kind of like want to control uh, Surabaya uh, at the time. And um, I think that's about the the control and uh, what kind of relation between the downstream and upstream. Um, I'm not really like understand what you are referring to, but um, of course uh, at the time uh, the upstream uh, area kind of like uh, provided a lot of uh, commodities uh, to be uh, to be brought uh, to the coastal area and then be traded to uh, people from um, coming from other places and and uh, also uh, vice versa. Uh, if, if goods or commodities coming from um, outside of Java, uh, it was kind of like easy to kind of like distribute all the goods uh, up to the, the um, upstream area. I hope that can answer the questions. Thank you, Agni. Um, thank you very much for fascinating talk and, and answering so many questions. Thank you to the audience for all your questions. Um, and you can see that we've posted there the link uh, to the uh, recording of this session. So I hope you'll um, encourage all your, your friends and colleagues to, to access the link. Um, yes, thank you, Ian. Uh, saying great presentation, many thanks coming in now. I'd just like to um, end this uh, session um, by saying that uh, we um, are planning to have the uh, workshop, the full day workshop on the 18th of May, finally, um, as a hybrid um, session uh, this year, uh, has been postponed for some time now due to the pandemic. Um, and so you will have seen um, a mail shot, I think in the last couple of days, biographies and restitution of Hindu and Buddhist objects from Java, Sumatra and Bali. Um, there'll be an updated um, email alert going out quite soon as well about the venue because that's changed slightly. But uh, if you're thinking about uh, coming to London at all, uh, please do consider this event. It will be very much in person as well as um, online. We look forward to seeing as many of you as possible attend um, one of the first uh, workshops to go back to um, the hybrid state of, of being um, at SOAS this year. Okay, so once again, thank you very much, Agni, um, for your time, and I hope everyone will be in touch with you soon with more questions. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye. Thank you.